verses, and I'm sure we can uh, all recall it by our head. In there, the Bible says, um, if my people, that's uh, how it begins, if my people uh, who are called by my name, and as I uh, reflect on that uh, verse, I'm wondering what would happen if we do just what that Bible verse says. What would happen if we, God's people, pray? What would happen if uh, we as uh, married couples get together and pray for our families? What would happen if all young people take some time to pray? What would happen if we really pray? I'm not suggesting that we don't pray, but I'm just wondering what would happen if Gurney Seventh-day Adventist Church prays. I invite us uh, this morning uh, to uh, come together as we pray as a church, as we lift um, our request to God, as we um, tell him everything that is on our minds. If you feel uh, uh, impressed to come forward, I invite you to do so or um, to kneel where you are or uh, it might be that uh, you need to sit where you are, that's fine, but uh, let's um, come together this morning as we seek God's face in prayer. This morning, we thank you uh, for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you uh, for allowing us to come together one more time. We thank you uh, for uh, protecting us and being with us uh, throughout the week. There are so many things that could have uh, happened or taken our lives, but we thank you that uh, you were with us, and because of that, we are, we are able to come here into your house of worship. We thank you uh, for the blessing of uh, the Sabbath day, a time to rest, a day that you gave us to um, take a break from uh, all of our labors and spend time with you. We thank you uh, for our church family. We have a lot to be thankful for. We thank you. But uh, we realize that uh, even though we have uh, a lot to be thankful for, even though you have been good to us, we have failed you. May you forgive us of our sins, Lord, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May you give us uh, the power to overcome um, the temptations that easily entangle us and restore to us the joy of your salvation. Give us uh, the power to um, conquer and to live uh, victorious lives. We come to you uh, this morning, Lord, uh, lifting up uh, the uh, prayer request uh, of your people. As we come, we have uh, many needs. We lift them up to you, Lord. We have many burdens. We bring them to you. We thank you for you told us uh, in the lesson today that um, if um, we uh, have burdens, we can bring them to you and uh, you give us your yoke, which is light. So we pray that uh, you may take um, all of our burdens, Lord, and give us your yoke, which is uh, easy. We come um, praying for the uh, vision of this church. The pastor just shared with us uh, that vision and uh, the possibilities which are out there. We lift, uh, we present that uh, to you, Lord. On our own, we don't know what to do. We don't know which way to turn. But we thank you because uh, with you, you, we know that uh, you can lead us. 
Therefore, we present uh, that uh, plan and uh, that vision, that idea to you, Lord. May you speak to us clearly. May you show us the way that we should go and help us to be able to listen to your voice. When you have spoken, may you give us the power to, to, to obey you and to follow your leading. We also um, come um, lifting uh, those uh, within our church who are sick. May you provide uh, healing for them. Among those who are sick is um, Wally who is recovering from surgery. We thank you that uh, the surgery was successful. May you help him as he recovers. We also lift up uh, Wanda who's um, suffering, uh, who's having problems with her back, Lord. May you touch her right now and uh, provide healing for her. Be with uh, others who are sick. Uh, we uh, continue to pray for um, Barbara Jeffy. Be with, uh, be with her at uh, the uh, Rehabilitation Center, Lord. Be with uh, Joseph Peachy. May you uh, also uh, help him uh, in his uh, struggle and uh, in his uh, journey. Be with uh, Jose Ramos, Lord. We also pray uh, for um, all those uh, who are in here who suffer from uh, different uh, sicknesses. We lift them up to you, Lord, the greatest physician. May you touch them and heal them. We also um, come um, praying for um, our families. I pray that uh, you may um, make our families stronger, Lord. We know that uh, the devil seeks to attack our families, but may you protect them. May you Bind us together with your love. Be with our children and uh, all the young people in this church. We also realize that uh, the devil seeks to attack them. But uh, may you provide uh, a special protection for them. May you help them to realize that uh, what the world offer is uh, not fun or it's not good at all. The only fun comes with being with Jesus and serving you. So may you help them realize that and uh, protect them. We also are uh, prayer for the uh, different ministries uh, in this church. We thank you uh, for um, how you are blessing uh, our ministries, Lord. May you continue to be with uh, the uh, ministry leaders. Help us uh, all as a church to uh, understand that we have a part to do in your ministry. I pray that uh, you may help us uh, realize that we have um, a responsibility to uh, carry your word to the world. Help us uh, realize uh, that uh, we all must uh, share your love with everyone that we come in contact with. May you put a burden for souls on our hearts, Lord. Help us not to rest until we have uh, shared with everyone the news that you are soon coming. There is a world out there, Lord, which is going to a Christless grave, and may you help us not to be comfortable. Help us to let them know that you are soon coming. I pray for um, our schools. May you uh, be with uh, the uh, leaders in our schools, Lord. Give them the vision that they need uh, to lead those uh, children to you. I also uh, lift up uh, the uh, Lopez family. I pray that uh, you may uh, comfort them as they uh, grieve the loss of uh, their father and their grandfather. As they mourn, Lord, may you help them uh, to hold on to the blessed hope, the hope that you are coming soon. We long for that day, Lord, when the last enemy, death, shall be destroyed. We long for that day when we shall say to um, death, where is your sting? May you keep us faithful until the day of your coming. I pray uh, for uh, pastor as he will be delivering the word uh, this morning. May you touch his lips, 
so that uh, he may say uh, the things that you would want your people to hear. And may you prepare our hearts so that we may uh, receive your message. When the events of this world shall come to an end, when the earth shall, be, shall move back and forth like a drunkard, when the heavens shall roll back like a scroll, when the Son of Man shall be seen coming through the clouds, I pray that we may all be able to stand and say, Lo and behold, this is our Savior, the one we have been waiting for so long. May you keep us faithful until that day, Lord. Oh, Father God, I pray that you may keep us until that day when our faith shall become sight. Keep us, for we cannot keep ourselves. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. to 15 and it reads this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends and you are my friends if you do whatever I command you no longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing if I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you do you not believe what I told you this morning
Last week, I told you in John chapter 6 that there was a reason why Jesus told the people to sit down. And I explained to you that sit means that it allows for you to be able to be still. It allows for you to be ready to receive. And it allows for you to be able to embrace, accept what God has prepared for you. Let me say that a little bit clearer. And I say that because I know what it takes to lose someone like me. I'm stubborn. Don't believe me, talk to my wife. But if God can move the hearts of man, he can move nature. He can move mountains. He can move rocks. He can move the stars, the skies, and the sea. Because let me suggest that those are easy in comparison to the heart of man. Last week I told you why God wanted the people to sit. Today, I'm going to tell you what God wants us to do when he calls us to sit. Let's pray. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, you did it again. You stepped on my toes. Now you're going to step on our toes. Lord, I want to pray that this message ears of understanding. Lord, help us as today we talk about this very thing in your precious name. Jesus. Amen. All around the United States, people are going to be celebrating Valentine's Day. And we all know what Valentine's Day is about. No, it is not about buying a card. No, it is not about buying flowers. No, it's not about giving those things to your husband, to your wife, so that you don't sleep on the couch. It is about L. One of the things that I have learned over the years is that we don't know enough. And I'm not going about, and I'm not talking about what you think or what you say. I'm talking about the way you love. You see, love is a word that when Jesus Christ came, he showed us what love is today I'm going to talk a little bit about love but I want to start in a little different way I want to see can anyone tell me what this place is up on the screen Epcot very good now this is a picture of Epcot anybody been to Epcot raise your hand man you guys need to get out I, I thought I didn't have a life. You've never been to Epcot? You need to go to Epcot. Epcot is a place that is fun. I want to ask you, what does Epcot stand for? Does anybody know why it's called Epcot? Are you kidding me? Nobody? All right, let me break it down for you. Epcot is actually an acronym for Experimental Prototype Community of Monarchs. Experimental Prototype Community 
of tomorrow. No wonder they call it Epcot. Try remembering that. Right? <clears throat> Epcot is supposed to show you what tomorrow's community is going to look like. But you know, as I thought about it, Epcot is not the original experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Do you know what is? Your city. The church. The church is the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. God started with the purpose of showing the world his redemptive love and what he had in mind before the fall of humankind. Amen? It is in this community that we call Gurney Seventh-day Adventist Church that we help mature each other in our broken places. We hold each other accountable for our blind spots and we encourage each other to be all God created us to be. This is the place where we empower strong marriages. I mean, marriage is the greatest thing, but it is the hardest thing I have ever known. I need to have other models around me to demonstrate what it means to be in a healthy, God-loving kind of marriage. Let me put it this way. I remember the story of a boy who was trying to find the right girl to marry. And so he found one and brought her home and introduced her to his mom. But guess what? She didn't like her. So he found another. And he brought her home to his mother. But guess what? She didn't like her either. Finally, after several attempts, the boy went out, found one exactly like his mom in every way, brought her home, and guess what the dad said? I don't like her. You see, a lot of marriages need help, including yours and mine. And let me suggest that this should be the place that we find that help. Amen? Not Dr. Phil. Not Dr. Drew. It's the church. This should be the place where we learn Christian parenting. This is a place where we should nurture healthy identities. That's what we are here to do, to model the community of tomorrow, the prototype. This should be a piece of heaven on earth. We are to model that and reach as many people as we can to be part of that community, of this community. I want you to look with me at 2 Timothy, verse 4, 13, because there we find a little nugget that I want to share with you. Timothy, 2 Timothy, verse, chapter 4, verse 13. Thank you, Daryl. Listen to what it says, because I underlined the key part there. Listen to what it says. This is Paul. And he says, when you come, what does he say? Bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, or Troas, and my scroll. And it says, especially the parchment. <laughs> what did Paul ask for? He said, bring me my cloak. You see, Timothy, in taking care of Paul's physical needs, he was being more than just an associate. 
he was being a friend. <laughs> you know, I don't like to call Valentine's Day Valentine's Day. Do you know what day I like what I like to call it? I call it friendship. You know why? Because I could always use a good friend. We need friends. You see, brothers and sisters, today's sermon is really about friendship. Because let me suggest that we have a church that is crying out for friendship. You know, I have tried to live out my preaching days by a rule that I once heard in a quote, and I want to share it with you. Let's go to the next slide, if you would. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Let me suggest to you that this is very, very important. If you forget anything from today, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. If we understood that, I think that we would have a lot more baptisms in our church. If we understood that, we would have more happy homes and marriages in our homes. If we understood that, we would be more happy in the workplace. If we understood that, we would be happy no matter where we go. You see, we tend to think that information is power. Let me say that we've got it all wrong. Information is not power. It is information that has been applied, that has been demonstrated, and has been lived out that breeds power. Anybody can rattle off something, but to live it. Well, that's, let me suggest to you, is why we admire Jesus Christ so much. Because he didn't just talk about it, he demonstrated it. How often have we heard that said, but it's true. I have seen more people reach with the gospel out of kindness than out of an explanation of theology by far. People want to know that you care. And when they see it, what a difference it makes in a person's life. Don't believe me? You should have come with me last week. When I went to the hospital and I visited with a handful of people from this church, Barbara Joffe. Don't believe me? Ask Sarah who was there, Kay who was there, Nanishka who was there, Steve Dokes who was there. There was tears in her eyes. Do you think it mattered what I said? No, what mattered to her is that I was there, that they were there. Now, this is not about guilting you into coming to the hospital on Saturday afternoon. This is just an example of how we can see clearly that what we just talked about is real. Paul, earlier in verse 11, I want to go there right now. We saw 13. Let's go back a couple verses to verse 11. Verse 11, sorry, says this. It says, get Mark and bring him with you because what? He is helpful to me in my ministry. Now, allow me to take the liberty to translate this. Paul here is simply saying, I need a friend. There are lots of people here, but I need a friend. Church family, there are a lot of people here. But there are people in this room that are in need of a friend. Paul was a great Christian, but even Paul knew he needed friends. He needed compassion. He needed to know that somebody cared about what he thought and what he did and who he was. 
Now, let's not be mistaken into thinking that Paul was alone. Paul was surrounded by people. There were prisoners. There were guards. But he was missing those who really loved him and shared with him. And there's a lesson to be learned there. You can be surrounded by hundreds and thousands and millions of people at a job, at school, at a hospital, by a grocery store, and even in church, and still feel lonely. Because you see, there's a difference between a crowd and a community, a group and a family. Let me ask you, which one are we? Are we a crowd or a community? Are we a group or a family? Be careful what you answer. Because I might hold you to that later. Better yet, God may hold you to that later. Think about what I just said. If I were you, I would first ask, Pastor, please tell me what it means first and foremost. Because let me suggest to you that I see a church that has a lot to learn about community. Has a lot to learn about friendship. Oh, don't get me wrong. We have spent a lot this time this morning thanking God for how far we have come. But let me suggest to you that this week God has brought us a reality check. We still have a lot to learn. I have a lot to learn. I didn't say you. I said we. So how do we go from being a crowd to a biblically based? Let me explain. Ah. How do we make this place a godly refuge? How do we let people know that they are cared for? How do I convince you that we care about you? In John chapter 5, we're going backwards again. Last week we talked about John 6. This week we're going to talk about John chapter 5. Because you see, when my wife and I were doing Bible study, it was amazing that I saw something I had never seen before. And this week when I got together with Kirk, I shared it with him. And we both agreed that sometimes we basically look at the Bible and we see what we want to see. But if we will open it, Open our eyes to looking at it just a little differently. It's amazing what God will show us. Now, I want you to go with me, and I have this. I have it up on the screen. For those of you who didn't have your Bibles, look at this. John chapter 5. And we're going to start there. We're going to start by laying the context, the place. Picking up verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Israel for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem, notice I underlined it, Near the sheep gate, a what? A pool. I don't know about you, but what does a pool contain? Good. You have the same kind of idea that I do. I've gone to some houses where I don't know that that's water. But it's good to know that you guys like water in your pool. Good. Look at what it says next. Which in Aramaic is called Bethesda or Bethsaida. And which is surrounded by five color covered colonnades. Now, once again, let me lay the groundwork. Talking of the place, it is the pool of Bethesda, and it's by the near the gate of sheep or sheep gate. Isn't that interesting? What kind of gate is it? Hold on to that thought, okay? You see, Jesus visits the people at the pool of Bethesda. They were all sick, and they believed that when the waters were stirred, if you're one of the first into the water, what would happen? Oh, I don't know about you, but I think we need some healing this morning. Amen? So let's continue on. Let's go now and let's talk about the people. Again, I'm still laying the groundwork. Look at the next few verses. By the way, this is just a picture just to show you guys what I'm talking about. That's the north temple wall of the temple of Jerusalem. That's Antonia. And if you look there, that little two red roots that are up there, that's where the pool of Bethesda is. Now, this is an actual replica that is there in the Holy Land, just to give you an idea of what it looked like during the time of Jesus. Now, let me go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. 
<clears throat> Here we go. Now let's talk about the people. In these lay a great multitude of what? Now this is important, people. These are not people who are healthy. They are what? Jesus himself said that the church is compared to what? A body. Why? Because it's a place for the sick. Raise your hands if you are sick today. Praise God, there's a few of you. The rest of you, you're going to have to take care of us. Because obviously you're healthy. Listen to what it says here. What kind of sick people were they? It says they were blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the movement of the water. I could go all day with some of this stuff. But we're going to keep going because I only have so much time. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Simply put, we need to go in and find out who these people are. Because it's interesting that it literally names three types of sick people. Number one, it names who? It names the blind. And let me suggest that a blind person represents a person who does not what? See the truth. The lame. We could say that that represents a person whose walk has been what? Crippled by sin. Brothers and sisters, tell me who here every time can literally look at truth and recognize it. I don't know about you, but sometimes it takes convincing me. That's why I believe that God has the Holy Spirit. Because he needs to convict us of truth. Tell me who here doesn't have sin in their life. Look at the third one. The third was a person who was paralyzed, and let me suggest that it is a person who has given up. Why? Because they can't move. They don't know which way to turn. They've given up. They have come to a dead end. A person who has given up. Now, let's talk about the person. The person found in John 5, verses 1 and 5. Listen to what it says. It says, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Now, verse 1 tells us that it was the man was a Jew. Because it was the Jews that were allowed to go into the pool of Bethesda. Now, this is very important. The man was a Jew. What is so telling about the fact that he is a Jew? Let me put it to you this way. He was one of God's chosen people. That's what he represents. You see, this man was not a pagan. Hence, the lame man represents a person who is a member of the family of God. Translation. And that is found in verse 6 and 7. Listen to what it says. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Duh. Right? I mean, come on, Jesus. Really? Friends, Jesus asked the obvious question. It's because. Look what happens next. The sick man answered, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Let me suggest to you, and I wrote it underneath. The problem is that this man was a lonely man. What's my proof? What proof do I have that this man was a lonely man? The proof is found in his response to Jesus. You see, his response was not, yes, I want to what? I mean, stop and think about that. If someone were to ask you if you were paralyzed, lame, and someone asked you want to be healed, you would say yes. But that was not his answer. This is why Jesus asked what he asked, because he wanted us to teach us something through this man's answer. His answer 
was simply, I have no one to help me. Do you understand the depth of that answer? Man, that it hit me like a ton of bricks this week. Let me put it to you in a way that might cry you. Let's go to Desire of Ages. Here's a picture of the man in a movie that I saw that was actually put out by Latter-day Saints that is literally word-for-word movie of John. Listen to what Desire of Ages, one of my favorite authors, The Savior saw one case of complete what? Wretchedness. It was that of a man who had been what? A helpless cripple. His disease was in a great degree the result of what? His own sin. And was looked upon as a judgment from God. Now look at what I underline next. So here is a man who represents a church member who is sick, who represents anyone who is part of the church because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So even if you think you're not sick, guess what? You're delusional right now. Eventually, you'll wake up. The Bible says we were all sick with sin. And what I find interesting is that he was not only a church member, he recognized his condition, but it also teaches us that he was friendless and lonely. How is this possible? Thirty-eight years, hundreds of people all around him day after day, but he didn't have one friend that would take the time to help him out. And it doesn't matter how many people you come into contact with. What matters is this. Do we take the time to develop meaningful relationships with one another? I want you to marinate on that for a second. Do we take the time to develop meaningful relationships with one another? I have to be honest with you. This sanctuary that we are sitting in is not the place for those gracious relationships to come free. Let me suggest to you, the sanctuary is not the place that those relationships are free. Oh, don't get me wrong, they can be helped along here. But so much of the bonding and the building up, the care takes place as we eat together, play together, fellowship in small groups, in social events, in prayer meeting. That's why Jesus just doesn't want us to ascend to his church on Sabbath morning. That's why just attending on Sabbath morning service will never bring us to the point of really satisfying that need for community. It takes more than a crowd, let me suggest. It takes a friendship. How are you doing in that area? You filled up with friends? Are you plugging into the church? Are you finding a refuge here in Gurney SBA Church? Are you finding a place of belonging here at Gurney SBA Church? Or better yet, are you helping others feel like they belong? Like they family of God. I told you I was going to step on your toes, but please forgive me and suggest that it is not me. Let me be so bold as to say that it is God. You see, I'm not here trying to basically make you feel bad or guilt you into 
Father, I'm here to appeal to you and to your better judgment. We need to change from being a youth to a youth chapter. We need to go from being a crowd to a community. Some questions. How can you gauge how can you gauge how well you are doing in this area? Well, allow me to suggest to you just four questions that I'm going to ask you to help you evaluate yourself on your connectability in the church. Here we go. Here they are. Oh, look at that. Number one, are you a member of the family of God? Translation, are you baptized into the family of God? You know, this is important. Because let me say that when we basically baptize you in the church, that is the best way to be part of a family. I like to say it's called adoption. We are adopting you into the family. There needs to be a choice. Here's the second one. Do you have a number of friendships in the church? Notice I didn't say people that you see as you go by. Let me use the word vital friendship. Let me define what a vital friendship is. It is a person, someone who is measurably in tune with your life. Do you have that kind of friend group at Gurney Seminary? Number three, do you have a meaningful task or ministry you take part in at the church? Because let me suggest to you, some of you need to hear this, just like I need to hear it. Not so much because I need a friend, because I'm not doing such a good a job of being a friend. Let me suggest that you are either one or the other. Either today, you are needing a friend, and you're just quiet and saying no. Or, you're being so quiet, you're just not saying anything. Because you know that maybe you have not developed friendships. Number four, do you regularly attend other services or events at church besides Baptist Memorial service? You see, when I signed up to be part of this church, I am not a Seventh-day Adventist. I am a seven-day-a-week Adventist. Do you understand the difference? I think if we understood that, we would have better attendance at prayer meetings better attendance at small groups, better attendance at ministry events. Think about that. Each person should at least attend one other regular attendance besides the Baptist morning service. Now, I don't know how you did on this test that I just gave you for these questions. But I do know that it's easy to drift in and out of service and never really connect with anyone. Let me suggest to you and to our church that it should be a goal of ours here at Gurney Seventh-day Adventist Church to make sure that we do our part to help everyone have a sense of community and family here at the church. Let me put it this way. Proverbs 18, 24 says this. A man slash woman that has friends must show them what? Friendship. We have another way of saying it that we say to our kids all the time. Alex is one of them. Son, daughter. in this church that need to have friends because they don't work friendship that means you take the initiative 
you visit them in the hospital or in their home, or to the new couple that just started to attend our church, to the new kid at Sabbath school, or the new person who is sitting right now next to you. You make the phone call. You give the invitation. You take the time to do something to get to know them. Do you know someone this morning that's lonely? I do. I have conversations with people in this church that's not here. They're lonely. Do you want to make a difference? Is there people in this church that they can be really friendly with and make a friendship with? Put a wrap on that. Don't take my word for it. I want you to listen to something. John chapter 21 verses 15 and 16 says it like this. And I believe that you and you listen to this and you can stop and you can understand and you can get it. He said, when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I want you to understand this. Right now, he's not talking to Simon Peter. Let me suggest to you that he is talking to you right now. And what he is asking is, Steve, Larry, Arnie, Alvin, do you Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Steve, my lamb, love me. See, we are very good with events in church. But I believe that we can help you with this. Yes, Lord, he said, you know the difference. Do you know the difference? Verse 16, again, Jesus said to us, to you, to me, do you love me? Then Jesus looked at them and he loved them. And so then he decides that he wants to take it one step further. And he wants to be very, very clear. And what was his answer? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus, in a very direct and a very specific way, Way said what? Take what? Care of my sheep. You know, that means that what God is asking you to do is to be shepherd And we know that the Bible says that the true sheep is any person who has a shepherd. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the what he has told us is this is what you are to do when you sit down. Your job is to take care of the sheep of the sheep. Do you understand that? Because I didn't hear one amen. Is this this hard to accept? Is this so hard hitting? Are we stepping too much on people's toes today? Please don't understand, misunderstand me. This is not me saying it's Jesus. In fact, let me drive it further. Look at what the next text has to say. Romans 8. Ah, excuse me. Romans 8, sorry, 13, 8 says this. Owe no one anything except what? Love one another, and I love this part. He who loves another has done what? Do you understand what this says? Let me suggest to you that if you are struggling with the law, let me say that here is the answer to how you don't struggle with the law. Start to love. 
love people. Stop pointing out what they're doing wrong. Start to love people. I find it amazing that the people who are the people that speak so much about the law don't understand. The law is not about information. The law is about understanding that it's about loving your neighbor. Don't believe me? Look what it says next. Again, repeated two verses later. Love does not harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is what? The fulfillment of the law. You know what's interesting? The people that are the ones that seem to be the most legalist are the people who don't even take the time to go love their neighbor. I find that fascinating. They're worried about the letter of the law, but they forget the entire law. The Bible says very clearly, oh, I can hear it now. There goes the pastor. It's all about love. It is. It is. You see, understand. You don't believe me? Look at Jesus' own words. He said, what? You want to keep the commandments? He said, I'll make it real simple because you guys still don't get it. He said, love your Lord, your God with what? And then he said, love who? Oh, wait a minute. I think he said, said, love the law, didn't he? Are you sure? Because we tend to think that it's love the law. Oh, wait a minute. No, it's maybe love that you are right. No? It says, love your neighbor. Go to the next verse here. Look at this. Let me drive it home again. For you, brethren, have been called to what? Liberty. That's the word we're using a lot today in today's political world. Liberty means you are called to be free. So what are we supposed to do with that freedom? Only do not use freedom as an opportunity for what? For the flesh, but through love, do what? Criticize each other. Point each other out where you're doing wrong to each other. What? It says, love one another. And again, he says it in 14. For the law is fulfilled in one word. He goes in to say it. You shall love. 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 You know, I wouldn't be quite has a quote that I, I wanted to, to bring today, and it just didn't seem right until I was here at the church. She said, Jesus Christ coming will not happen until his church demonstrates fully the love of God. Notice she didn't say, she didn't say we'll come when we have fulfilled the law, but when we have demonstrated fully the love of God. Because you see, understand that what God wants from us is not the mere law. I look at my wife, I don't look at law. Even though we have laws, things that we come to an understanding of, I look at her out of love. That fuels me. That motivates me. That encourages me. I want to ask a question. My time is long up. feed his sheep, to take care of his sheep. And I want to know today, are you guys willing to answer God's call? Are you willing to? I've instructed the deacons to please pass out something that I'd like to give you as a gift for just for a few minutes. And I'm asking you to help me. That's right. Help carry this. Remember, it's better to give 
be. So I'm giving, and then you'll give it back. Be it the simple. Be it the simple. These are cards that I designed this week. I'm calling them sick cards. Sick, let me suggest to you, stands for shepherd, S, in, I, train you, T. I have displayed to you, and I've brought before you my best argument of why it is that we need to do a better job of building community in this church. We are called to be shepherds and trainers. We are called to take care of each other. What we're going to do is for anyone who would like to, the pastor will not force you because I can't. I can try and guilt you. So let me suggest that I'm going to give you a second to think of five or seven things. I want you to take these cards and I want you to fill them out. Better yet, let me say it this way. God wants you to fill them out. Because what we're going to do is in these cards, I want you to print your name, I want you to print your phone number, and I want you to print your email. And here's what we're going to do. What good does it do that we basically say amen and then we go home and we forget about what we just basically said? Part of what I believe my job as a pastor is not to just present the truth, but to basically help you to apply the truth. So these cards is the application of that truth. Because when you fill these out, let me suggest that Kay and I are going to sit down and we are going to match you up with your own Valentine whatever term you want. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to let you know who the person is that you are going to adopt. And your job will be to take care of that sheep. How? You will have their contact information. Every week, I'm going to suggest to you, call them up and say, hey, I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you today. I just want to know What do you want me to pray about for you? Start to get to know these people. We're going to try to match up people with other people that they don't know. So that Arnie, you're not going to get Larry. And Larry, you're not going to get Arnie. Sorry. Because you guys are already friends. We want to match people up with people that don't know each other. So that we as a church can exercise our community building muscles. I don't know about you, but I don't want to just play church. I want to be a church. And the best way to be a church is to make it real and bring it home and to start practicing it. You see, as I said to you earlier, this is Epcot. This is the place that we are going to learn to have community. And the good news is we're not going to charge you. And no, you don't get to stay for just a day and then go home. You can come here as often as you want. But I want to be part of a living community. And I believe that it can exist today. Not tomorrow, but today. But this will be preparation for tomorrow. And so we were asking you guys to fill these out, and then we're going to pick them up at the door. Again, the goal will be is that we're going to match you up with someone, and you're going to adopt them. You want to call them your secret pal? You want to call them your pin pal? You want to call them your best bud? That's fine. But your job will be to get to know these people. Pray with them. Take them out to eat. Take them bowling. Take them for a pizza. Come to their home. Invite them to your home. But let's start to be a community that really cares for each other. Can we do that? Oh, I know that I'm asking a lot. Please forgive me, but let me say that I'm not asking anything of you. God is asking this of you because this is what God wants. And I believe that I want to be a part of that. And I want to take you with me. And so as you fill this out, we're going to basically end, and then we're going to sing a song, and then we're going to pick up those cards at the door. Now, you can circumvent me, and you can go through the back door, and I won't judge you. Because God didn't call me to judge me. He called me to love you. So I'm going to love you, and it won't change. I'm not forcing you. God's not forcing you either. That's the thing that's so awesome about God is he doesn't force us, but he is always in love with us. And so if you want to be a part of this, praise God. But if you want to be a friend, 
or you want to have a friend, you need to fill out the, pa the paper. Now, that's not the only way. You can do it on your own. But this is just an aid to help us in this process. So in a moment, we're going to have a word of prayer. But again, at this church, what does it mean to sit? Thank you, Alvaro. Good to know somebody heard me. What does it mean to sit? Shepherds in training. So at this church, when we ask you to sit, every time an elder says, you can sit now, what does that mean? It's that you are a shepherd in training. It will reshape and redefine the way you look at the word sit forever. Because from here on out, when that word sit is used, you will know that it is, a.k.a., a call to be a shepherd in training. Just like when I say the word fod, we know that it means what? Favor of God. We call you to sit. Know that it's a reminder that you are called to be a shepherd in training. I have a drink. I have a drink. Someday there will be a church that truly demonstrates the love and the character of Christ. I want to be a part of that. Do you? Then let's work on that. Let's work on that. I'm not going to call you every week and say, Nanette is being called Maria. I'm not going to do that. This is as far as I can take the hook. Do you hear me? I cannot afford to do that. But I can be and gracious, wonderful Savior. As our Father, what you yearn for most is that we not act like trained shepherds in training. That we act like children waiting for you. Today you have made it clear that the way to do that is by us taking the care for each other. Lord, I want to pray. Today you have heard and you are seeing in each heart that there is a need. Lord, I pray that you will remind us every day to take the time to sit with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So that when we come to Christ, children say amen. All right, I believe we have a closing hymn. And by the way, if you want to start practicing how to sit, you can do that at fellowship dinner.
I struggle with it every day. And I don't want to. Today, we just say, I'm going to find a friend. How do we become a friend? By leaning on him. By recognizing that Jesus is Lord. In following your example. In seeing how you treat others. We have an example of how we need to treat each other. Lord, help us to be more friendly. That we may go from being a crowd to a community. From being just people to being a people. Lord, do it in Jesus' name. In the precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you, brothers and sisters. We have a wonderful fellowship dinner prepared for you guys. They did an awesome job of decorating. Thank you, Marie, and the fellowship dinner ministry. We invite you to please stay and fellowship. Be friendly with one another. God bless.